A man of many talents. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hall Center for the Humanities. I'm Giselle Anatol, the current interim director here at the Hall Center. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I would also like to thank Kansas Public Radio, uh, the Friends of the Hall Center, and the host of other donors who make events like this possible. And now it is my great honor to introduce you to tonight's esteemed guest. Uh, Lewis R. Gordon is Yukon Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Global Affairs at the University of Connecticut Stores. His areas of specialization include Africana philosophy, existentialism, phenomenology, philosophy of science, philosophy of medicine, uh, philosophy of medicine, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis, social and political philosophy, philosophy of education, aesthetics, and philosophy in film, literature, and music, philosophy of culture, race, and racism, and global Southern thought. Um, and you might think that with a list like this, okay, well, he can't possibly know all of those things, but he does. <laughs> it was just amazing um, at dinner um, to hear um, this um, I always say that my mind is like a steel trap, that things go in and then they never come back out. But his mind is really the steel trap, like the things come in and then they come back out. Um, really um, tremendous. Professor Gordon is a prolific author um, with titles such as Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, published by uh, with Rutledge, Rutledge in 2021, and Fear of a Black Consciousness, uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, 2022, um, which has already been translated into German, Portuguese, and Brazilian Portuguese. Some of his most influential writings have recently been collected uh, in a volume entitled Black Existentialism and Decolonizing Knowledge, uh, the writings of Lewis R. Gordon, published by Bloomsbury and edited by Rosanna Mart and Sion Day. Gordon serves as the editor of the American Philosophical Association blog series, Black Issues in Philosophy. He co-edits with Jane uh, Anna Gordon, the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, as well as the Roman and Littlefield book series, uh, Global Critical Caribbean Thought. He has recently added to his plate um, the co-editorship of the Rutledge India book series, Academics, Politics, and Society in the Post-COVID World. He does not solely rest on his laurels as a researcher and scholar, however. He also serves as the honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, and during his illustrious career, he has taught as a visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg and Fort Eyre University. Hare University. He was selected as a distinguished scholar at the PJ Patterson Center of, uh, for Africa Caribbean a uh, Advocacy at the University of West uh, of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. And in 2022, he was bestowed with the Eminent Scholar Award uh, from the Global Development Studies Division of the International Studies Association. Most recently, um, he was interviewed this past December by a renowned, uh, renowned journalist, Tavis Smiley, for a discussion of how to live more ethically and courageously. Uh, and um, he was interviewed uh, also in December by Natalie Etoke for an article with the Boston Review, considering what it means to be free and the spaces uh, for freedom that get opened up by black existentialist thought. And in the midst of this exceptionally busy schedule, he has agreed to come to KU, to Lawrence and spend some time with us. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Lewis Gordon. Thank you, Giselle. Also, thank you, all of you who have come out this evening. I uh, will begin first by just setting a tone. I even though I was playing the piano before. 
you could you could do this way. Because I also play drums. Not a very colonial rhythm was that. Right? You could imagine someone coming and say, cut it out. Do this. Doesn't exactly want to make you groove. But that's a subtext, of course, for tonight's meeting. In New England, one could say in the indigenous language of the Wampanoag, Wunikisuk, or if one is going to deal with Choctaw, Holito. It's a good idea sometimes to connect to those ancestors and the people who are still here. We could also say Hotep. We could say Shalom, Assalamu Alaikum. Hotep, of course, means uh, may peace be with you. Shalom means the same thing. A lot of people actually mistakenly think shalom is about peace, like about in the context of war, but it isn't. Because Shema, which is part of the roots of shalom, is to hear. So when one is connecting with another, one can greet it's already a fundamental sociality of goodwill on another human being. In some societies, such as in Isuzulu, you could say Sabona. And Sabona means I see you. Could you imagine if you're in the wilderness, you're alone, you're afraid, and then another human being pops up and says, I see you. And there's one says, I see you too. You both exhale. So this, among so many ways from Bonsoir, good evening, all the way through even to some people who may be Irish, Jewish. There's so many ways we greet one another. And the fact that we greet one another at all is to acknowledge our commonality, our connectedness. So I thank you also for bringing me out here to Kansas. I gotta tell you, uh, <clears throat> We have a short time together, but I, I got to tell you, um, you got some stuff to brag about in Kansas. We already know Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> and you already know, at, at least for a time, you got a talus woman, Taylor Swift. <laughs> some powerful stuff there. But there are all kinds of other things that are here. Uh, I mean, I have a lot to talk about, but in a way, it's called, one of the reasons I call it the kitchen in the pub, by the way, there's a lecture I gave, and I'm going to explain that, but it's actually part of a series of lectures, and I'll explain that as well. But what I'm going to talk about today is another part of it, okay? But I'm going to jump ahead because I got to tell this Kansas story. I just got to tell this story. Um, about 18 years ago, I was in Kansas City. I was speaking at a meeting, and you know it was February, in fact, and you know it's Black History Month. So a little shout out to Mahomes as well. He's making a lot of Black History. There was this meeting where, as as everybody, I was the keynote for the meeting. Everybody's giving their talks, and there was a group of Black women medical anthropologists, and these medical anthropologists were conducting an empirical epidemiological study on black women's health, okay? Now, they had 200 black women. They encouraged them to do healthy stuff, you know, like not smoke, reduce the coffee, take walks, eat vegetables, you know, that kind of stuff. They had regular physicians, check, you know, checkups and so forth. Everything was going great. They were following it to the letter. But then after a year, there was a problem. Their cholesterol level just would not go down. So this required, because these are empirical scientists, they had to go and figure out why. And after much careful study, the 200 women were gathered in a room The, the researchers went, said, you're all doing great, stop smoking, you're doing everything great, great, yes, great. 
But there's one problem. Japanese cars, American cars, in other words, all walks of life. Jane and I looked at each other and said, looking good. <laughs> Packed. We go in. All they said, iced tea or lemonade. It was buffet. All right, so we said, iced tea. So we go, we sit down. Uh, I always tease my wife. Uh, she just so loves vegetables. Her Hebrew name is Yael for deer. So I would say, you could go graze. I'd be lying to the ribs. The host, he's on a diet. Because he was about nearly 400 pounds. He went to get his vegetables. I got a mountain of ribs. I sat down. And all I remember was a white light. And in front of me were just bones. So I got up and went back and came back with another. And he said, yo, take it easy. I said, wait, I gotta, so I started that. Now, you know, I'm a little satiated. I'm enjoying this. He said, oh man, you really gotta try this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. So I said, you know, Jane, you got, she said, oh. She, she tasted it, she said, oh my God. So she goes, comes back with a mountain. So then I said to this fellow, you know, you got it? And he said, no, nah, man, I'm from Chicago. I'm a Chicago ribs guy. Now I've traveled all over this country. I've eaten ribs, Georgia, Carolina, and South Carolina, and Mississippi, Tennessee, Texas, all over the place. So, you know, you know I may be Jewish, but yo, I got intelligence. And so as we, so I said, so I said, you gotta at least try one. So he said, all right, you know, just to be a good host. He goes like this, and the man let out an invective and said, Oh man, and you should see this poor man schlep over to the, the buffet as if he were enslaved. You know, it's like, whew, get over there, eat. And he came back with a pile. When we were in the plane leaving and my face was pressed against the window, looking down, I turned to Jane and said, I'm so glad we don't live here because we would die. <laughs> so I'm, I start my talk by telling you, you're, you're, the, you're not only Super Bowl champs, <laughs> but this is a state that's got the mountain top of ribs. <laughs> Story number two, <clears throat> the title of this talk. Well, the title of this talk comes out of a rather interesting situation. Last year, I got this email from Newfoundland in the Arctic, the northeasternmost point of North America. The talk, the, the, the invitation was for me to give a talk and I was informed I could do it remotely. And I said, the Arctic? Nah, I'm going. He said, no, no. I said, I'm coming up. And so, and it was, it was a student who wrote. He said, really? You got, because most people just don't want to come. I said, nah, I'm coming. So it turned out because I had to give a talk in Montreal and I had another talk I had to give in Toronto, I decided to do a kind of triangle. I figured I'll go to Montreal. And so it'll be, they don't have to, I told them they don't even have to worry about it. I'll just hook up a plane and get up there. So I'd get up on a plane from Montreal and go up into the Arctic, you know? And then from there, I'll go to Toronto. And of all things, the talk in Toronto was on black mental health, just to give you an idea. So in my head, I'm gonna to go to the Arctic. So I'm gonna go on the plane, you know what I mean? And I imagine what the people on the plane will be like. There's just gonna be a whole bunch of white people and Inuit. And I get on the plane and there's a bunch of white people and Inuit. So I said, this is real. 
okay? Because the last time I heard the name Newfoundland was when I was in elementary school and we're learning about the Vikings from Iceland to Greenland to Newfoundland. So from your elementary school, and I was one of these people when I studied history, it was very imaginative. I wanted to get to, you know, see this place. And before I looked up where the university was and, you know, these catalogs are all the same. No matter where they are, every catalog is gonna find a happy black woman or a black man smiling. <laughs> it doesn't matter where it is. If there was a planet Mars, they'll have this. So I said, okay, standard stuff. So you see people who look like they're descendants of Vikings and a happy black woman, right? So I said, okay, so we're, we're gonna go. And as I'm, as we're there and I'm looking over, there's just ice, 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 snow. We finally come down and we're landing. Everything, we get into St. John's. And the first thing hit me was the beautiful smell of the air, the kelp, the sea. And also, the, uh, despite how cold it was, because of all of that sea air, the humidity makes it actually comfortable. Because what thing goes through our mind is, what in the world would make people go to such a cold place and settle? But you realize it's actually quite pleasant. Then when I was there, before I went, because it was a student who wrote me, I thought I was speaking university, but when folks heard I was coming, I was informed that their public lectures were given in a pub. So I said, I will speak in the pub and I entitled my lecture, The Kitchen in the Pub. So when I showed up in the pub, which is where everybody in the island would come, right in front of me was this packed pub of people from all over the place. We had a great time. The thing that was striking is the people in front of me were, and as I discovered in St. John's, everywhere I, met, I went, I met people who were from South Africa, Belize, Jamaica, Zimbabwe, Vietnam. These are all, as I heard, rather warm places, all right? Namibia, Tanzania. There were all these black people. There were all of these South Asian people. There were people from Morocco, from Tunisia. They were in the audience. And there were also the people who are descended from Irish and people from Scandinavia. So we're just all there. So, and at that moment, as I got to speak with them and talk with them and get to learn about them, I began to crack up because all of them had the same response I had when it was like, yo, you want to go to the Antarctic? And they were like packed in 10 minutes, right away, ready, right? People from the tropics and warm areas would want to go there, just like if you lived in Scandinavia or the Antar in Antar you know, in, in the Arctic, if someone said, hey, you want to go to Jamaica? You want to go to Trinidad? They'll be packed in 20 seconds. So I began to crack up, of course, because even a person who studies human beings, who deal with stories of race and many of those, sometimes we forget their universal human stories. That human beings want to meet human beings in places that they won't normally meet them. And that it was, I was just being absolutely normal. <laughs> there was nothing unusual about it. This is a core thing for us to think about. I bring this up because in that lecture, it turned out as I spoke in the pub, when a member of the audience put an iPhone down on a, on a seat and the recording was so good that she shared it with Canadian Broadcasting Radio. So if you wanna hear that lecture, I, you could, I could send, share it with her. It's, it's available on Canadian Broadcasting Radio. But it struck me, what, one of the reasons I was excited about do, do, doing that talk is because I also, at the time, was the chair of the Public Philosophy Committee for the American Philosophical Association. And I have a strong opinion on this issue. I think philosophy is the most alive when it's public. The very notion of private philosophy, I would argue, is a contradiction. And it's a contradiction for many reasons because ultimately, when you're doing philosophy, 
you're making yourself accountable to others. The idea that you make yourself accountable exclusively to yourself means that you can now ignore evidence, truth, the rest of, rest of humankind. In fact, you don't see it, but I'm speaking right now without my shoes on. And I also teach without my shoes on. I do a lot of things without my shoes on. In fact, there was one time I even gave a lecture in December in Moscow without my shoes on. And that's a whole other story because it was dissidents who invited me, and it, but I will digress. But it's a cool story of what one world made this guy end up in Moscow in December in 2018. But anyway, the, the thing is, the reason I take my shoes off has many explanations. There are people who heard about it and sometimes there are people who come because I teach public classes. I don't believe classes should be private. When I taught at Brown, for instance, there were a lot of people who come to my classes and I thought they were parents of my students. It turns out they were just tourists. And I would say, really? What? Well, how do you know about my class? And it turns out in the Rhode Island Guide, <laughs> they had put that people should go to my classes. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking, boy, you know, these are dedicated parents. And some of them would say, if we hear you to teach without your shoes, and it's true. The reason is first, it's an act of humility to acknowledge the sacred. I think whenever we speak, whenever we teach, we are accountable, not only the people before us, but the people who preceded us and the people to come. The very concept of evidence in philosophy, the evidentiality of evidence, is to have witnesses that may even transcend, they become anonymous. So you go through this act, and it doesn't mean, it, some people do it different ways. Some people put something on their head, they may wear a special scarf, whatever it may be. But to remind ourselves of what it is to be responsible for truth. The long list of things you hear I work on that happened over the years because ultimately they actually all connect because my work in a nutshell, I often say it sounds like a lot, but my work comes down to the human being's relationship to reality and the many unfortunate ways we try to avoid it. And those unfortunate ways sometimes are very violent and very abusive in other ways. A lot of the isms we talk about, racism, sexism, homophobia, the long list classism, a lot of those things are efforts to avoid reality. They avoid reality precisely because they demand that we lie to ourselves about others. And it doesn't mean even if when we're good, well-intentioned that we don't even have little lies that may misrepresent things. In the story I told, right, began with stereotypes. Because of course, when I landed in Newfoundland, I expected only to see Inuit and white people, not a burgeoning global cosmopolitan place. Because today in the world, it's so easy for people to find themselves to be in places with other people. So as even we, the specialists, also have to interrogate ourselves to found our humility. The other thing too is, and I quipped when I was there, I'm from Jamaica, and some people say, yeah, but he also takes his shoes off because you could take the man out of the island but not the island out of the man. And then there's a third, which is it's comfortable. And here's the point, all could be true. And in fact, all are. See, one of the problems we have today is we treat truth, evidence, and connectedness in the language of war. If you think about the way people would sometimes even talk about their research, it's as if they have to destroy another in order for themselves to shine. 
There are a lot of problems with that. The obvious problem is that it's possible to win a fight and be wrong. History is full of people who won wars who are wrong. We know right now there are wars going on in the world. And the problem when people are dealing with war, war's objective is the elimination of the other. But what you may discover when you eliminate the other is that you are the bad guy. So we need to think in a very different way. The subtext or the subtitle of today's talk is also tonight's talk. It's also about issues for our times. And in the one I gave in New Finland, as I said, that's another talk. I gave a set of issues for our times. But this part, which is the continuation, is that we have several fundamental issues that we have to deal with as a species. And one of them is how we deal with conflict. Now, what I mean by this is there's no such thing as any human relationship without conflict. But you see, the mistake we make is to misunderstand conflict. There are healthy forms of conflict. Some conflicts make us grow. If you're in a conflict premised upon the commitment to coexistence, for example, then you are invested in building a relationship out of the conflict, you see? But if you relate to another in the language of war, there's no investment in coexistence or relationship. It's exclusively the elimination of the other. To bring this home, uh, one of the things I, uh, uh, I love to do, I'm the head of my department, is we have a lounge. I love going in the lounge because there are doctoral students in the lounge and we have conversations. One of the things though is, you know, when you're on college campuses, uh, coffee gets pretty expensive. And, you know, Hegel started this thing. Hegel believed that philosophers needed coffee. You know, you, you can imagine, you know, the ancients would say, but hey, what about wine? Symposia. Well, I have discovered recently that uh, as I was dealing with the administrative assistant, that we're now averaging $1,400 a semester in coffee. <laughs> I couldn't believe that they're like, and it turns out the, the other department, sociology, is, only takes a tiny fragment of the coffee. So philosophers really drink coffee. But as I was speaking with the students, there was one student who's married and we got into a similar conversation. And he was wondering about this because although war is a form of conflict, it's telos is different. What I said to him was, you're a married person. You and your partner have conflicts. However, try to imagine if you looked at your partner as an enemy. And when I said that, he just shuddered. You see, just the very thought, because he knew the very idea, of course, he loves this person. The idea to be in a project of this person's elimination made him immediately see the point. And you could see already the larger implications. Because when we think about democracy, we think about societies. There are people who are so conflict averse precisely because they cannot see the distinction between conflict and war. One of the signs that we're having problems in our society, and not just the United States, but across the globe, is that authoritarianism sends the lie that there's on the only kind of conflict is war. So the stakes become so high that you can't develop and learn from others the productive kind of investments, what it is to be invested in living together. You see, we have Nancy Snow here, who does her work on virtue connects to these issues. Because if there's anything, I prefer to, I like arete for a variety of reasons. Whenever I do it, I go through the etymology and all of that and in different languages, whether it's, a, but, but, but the basic 
the basic insight in all virtue theory is that being a good person is something you have to work at. Right? It doesn't come easy. And it's a similar thing about being a healthy society. A healthy society is something we have to work at. And that working at it requires the ability to deal with conflicts. It's rather striking, I was playing the piano, and at first, for instance, Giselle said, said something that I often hear when I see pianos. There's one time I was giving a lecture in South Africa. It was in selection existentialism. And I like to come to play lectures early. Thank God there's a piano. You know, increasingly places don't have pianos in places where you're supposed to speak. So I remember one time I was in South Africa and I saw a piano, I went over to play and my host ran over and he said, it's not tuned. I said, no problem. So I started playing the piano and I'm having a good time playing the piano. And before you know it, the audience arrived. And when I, and it was time for me to speak, I stopped, they applauded. And my hosts went over and said, they both of them said, I thought it was untuned. And they said, it is. Who says an untuned instrument can't make music? Right? It just means you got to play it differently. In fact, this is one of the messages we have learned from country music and hip hop. Many of you may not know this, this great artist, but have you ever heard of a hip hop artist called Biz Marquee? Okay, some people know what I'm talking about. Biz Marquee has a song called You Got What I Need. The beat is. And, then he, and here's the point, he sings out of tune. He goes, you got what I need. And you say he's just a friend. And then he gets in front of he says, oh, baby, you. And it's great. If he were to sing that on, in tune, on key, it would be a terrible song. But you see, the point about what I'm saying with the piano and the music, it's just a great metaphor about democracy. You see, we spend so much time trying to tune people that we forget what it is to communicate with people in ways that enable them to contribute and offer the tones that can make the society make music. Now, already I'm doing something metaphilosophical. Metaphilosophical just means about philosophy. Because instead of just coming in and just telling you all kinds of philosophical stuff, the truth of the matter is that there have been thousands of years of philosophers thinking through the fact that philosophy is ultimately about reminding us that we're all in it together. When I teach my classes, for instance, I usually always begin classes with two conversations, actually three. The first conversation I always have with my students is what is a school? It's fascinating. How, could you raise your hands? How many of you have had a conversation on what a school is? Yeah, you see, which is great. That's actually, the fact that four people raised their hand is actually huge. For years, I've been asking this question for 40 years. I created schools in New York way back in the 80s and things like that. But the thing that's wild is in universities, you got a lot of people who spend a lot of time in school, yet never had a conversation about what schools are. When we look at the history of, if we look at it, there are many languages we could talk about school in. But in the language of Greek, you have skole, but translated it means leisure time. I remember when I was teaching uh, adolescence in secondary school and we had that conversation. And when I explained to them leisure time, they're like, back then it was Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon say, what? Leisure time? And they would be shocked. And I said, yeah. Because ancient people understood that it's pretty rough out there. But what we created through culture, civilization, is a world in which we can have the suspension of exigency 
that will afford time for us to devote to uniquely human things. That's what school's about. You commit, and so automatically you could see, for instance, today we're in a humanities center. It's very strange that there are people treating the humanities in universities as if it's a separate thing. The entire premise of a university is the humanities. Whether it's the professional schools, whether it's the, the STEM areas, whether it's even the conversations in the coffee shops, the purpose is to create a space in which exigency suspended, in which you can devote to human things. Sometimes we forget that our education is about the cultivation of our humanity. So I try to have that conversation because too many people today are busy trying to get certification instead of education, okay? The next one, of course, is to have a conversation on what is a student and what is a professor. I often have students talking to students. It's amazing what students say professors are. They basically say we're Moses with the tablets. They want us to come or, or to be evangelical. Heal. You know, just put knowledge in their head, right? So then I'd say, well, can I give my two cents? And then, then I said, well, I define a professor as a person who fell in love with learning. A person who fell in love with learning so much that we continue to learn even if we have to teach ourselves. That thing about teaching ourselves is called research. When we forget that the results, all of that stuff, we have to share. This is back to the community. And thus, what a professor is, is an advanced student with beginning students. But here's the thing, everybody in this room who has taught knows. Even if you teach the same course every semester, every semester you learn something from your students. And that's because your students have different experiences than yours. They have different orientations. And as a consequence, that helps you learn more. And it's striking what happens when students see the environment as a co-learning environment, because they become active rather than passive. Because they now know they don't only learn with me, they learn with one another. Which brings us back to the difference philosophically. Because you see, the agonal beat em up model can be replaced with a different model, which is a community working together to see what we fail to see, hear what we fail to hear, understand what we fail to understand. Because everyone in the community is accountable. Okay? Now, the last, next one is philosophy, because I teach philosophy classes. I don't only teach those. I actually am a professor of many disciplines. But when I'm teaching philosophy classes, it's strange to me when people teach classes and don't have a conversation on the subject. They, they may just go right to it. But I actually try to spend about a week or two just talking about what philosophy is. Students are often shocked because one of the things I do is I put in the syllabus, I always put in the syllabus a paragraph from somebody reflecting on philosophy from the ancient world. And, and when I say that, in everybody's head, they imagine ancient Greece. As if people didn't begin to think until they ended up in the Greek, <laughs> you know, the Hellenic Islands. But I actually give something from 4,000 years ago in ancient East Africa from a philosopher named Antef. Sometimes I also give something from Nuatl speaking people in Mesoamerica. It's striking because you see the metaphors people use about what brings them to philosophy are crucial. Today, we think a lot about math and all of that stuff, but a lot of early philosophy was done by physicians. Philosophical work was looked at as a practice of healing. Aristotle was a physician. 
as an example. Hotep was, get this right, Hotep was nearly 2,000 years before Aristotle, was a physician and philosopher. If you look at a lot of the, 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 the Nuatu speaking people are people of different names like Mexicans and so forth, okay? Uh, Aztec is not actually the name of a people, it's an ideal that the people have. But the point is, whether it's in ancient China, ancient India, whether it's in ancient Nubia or ancient Kemet, people thought about these things. And here are some of the things too, I try to have them look at the writings by women from the ancient world, like press ahead. There are many people don't realize, for instance, and we usually have a conversation around this. Many of you, for instance, have looked at Paleolithic art, but many of you may not know that most Paleolithic art, estimated 75% of them were painted by women. And I'm sure a lot's going through your head now when you realize women painted them. A lot of many don't really know that the, early, the earliest scientists were women. There are many reasons for that, but this lecture is not on science. <laughs> But go and look it up and you'll see why. And there were special names. And for instance, in ancient languages, it's, if you could read the languages and I could read some of them, I would read and you'll find out that a lot of things that we were thinking that were masculine were dudes turned out to have been women who were writing them. For instance, there's a whole area of science called Rex from which the practitioners were called the Reket in ancient East Africa. Well, the record were predominantly female. Why I say predominantly female is because I don't want to use the gender binaries we use today. You see, a lot of the ancient world may not have thought in the way we think today. So there could have been anatomical males exemplifying the female spirit in those communities. But the record, they looked at the laws of nature and the laws of society. But when Years later, those areas became colonized, first by the Macedonians or the Greeks. You know, Alexander was a Macedonian. And then eventually the Romans. They had a patriarchal model. So Rex became Rex. Because the idea was the lawgiver, the scientist, the thinker had to be male. And you know the history of the name Rex to Richard, Ricardo, etc. But the point is that getting to learn that for students make them ask important critical questions about the past in a way that's Sankofic. And many of you may not know what Sankofic is, but that refers in the Akan people, right? In the Adinkra sign of a bird that's moving forward, reaching back to pick up something on its back that it may have left behind. The argument is, if we we're to move forward, although we cannot embrace everything from the past, we need to find out what is vital from the past that will enable us to move forward. We can't move forward if we continue the lie that thought itself can only come from one small group of human beings who are male. Similarly, the fact that I said Africa already answered that question. <laughs> and the fact that the students, when they read these things, when somebody comes and tells them philosophy began 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, my students would, instead of they say simply no, they could say, well, we were just discussing this text. See, sometimes we proselytize and we tell people, but it's better for people to be active and learn it. So I don't at all, when I teach it, tell them that philosophy began everywhere. We just simply read it. We could talk about women thinkers in the past all we'd like. It's much better to teach their work. You see, it'll speak for itself. So that meta philosophical point now, I'm going to move very quickly because we have a short time. I was told 45 minutes. It's Black History Month. One of the things I'm known a lot for is black existentialism. And black existentialism is connected to some of these problems that I'm talking about today. Because already, you see, we're dealing with a problem today. When I brought up the question of conflict, we're dealing with a way of looking at ourselves as a species 
that is undermining our humanity. When all is said and done, if we talk about anti-Black racism, we talk about sexism, we could talk about a lot of these categories. When all is said and done, we need to remember that we're talking about the dehumanization of human beings. When all is said and done. Which means that we need to reflect on what it means to be a human being. The philosophical question of our humanity is something that is complicated precisely because to be a human being is not exactly being, it's to stand out and face possibility. Because you see, we, is something we all know. What we all know is something that haunts every one of us. And I could put it in a very simple way. There was a time when none of us was here. There was a time when none of these planets was here. There was a time that could have just been without time. And we're all haunted by the possibility that that will come again. In more concrete form, you could imagine, some of you may have had this experience if you have children. I have four children. A boy, a girl, a girl, a boy. They're all grown up now. I was lamenting with Giselle, I miss my babies. You know, they're all these big adults who try to school me. Yeah, and I gotta take it. They're like, yo dad, man, we gotta, t we, gotta we, we just gotta explain things to you. Man. Yeah, I know, we, you know, I said, yeah, I know I'm a professor and all. Yeah, I know they're, you know, one of the embarrassing things about kids is sometimes they're in, when they were in universities or in high school, there are people who not, didn't know they were my kids that would pull them over. One of my sons, the guy, teacher pull over and say, yo man, you got a good head on your shoulders. You, sh you should read some people, you know, you should read Lewis Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we were, I remember one time we were looking at pictures and we were looking at these pictures and our, my youngest son at that time, he was just began to speak and he was two and a half years old and we used to call him Mr. Poppy. So we're looking at pictures. We're looking at pictures, we see the eldest, pictures of the, the eldest daughter, pictures of the youngest daughter. Everybody's looking at the baby, we're smiling and Mr. Poppy looks and he got very upset. And we're like, what's the matter? And he said, where is Mr. Poppy? <laughs> now you could see the trauma. <laughs> not only was he not in those pictures, but we had the nerve to be happy. There we were. Life is good. The idea that life could ever be good without him. <laughs> But of course, that story is a metaphor for us, isn't it? We have all these myths and these things to prop us up and tell us we're so special. But the reality is, the world beyond the human world has absolutely no reason to give a damn about us. It's perfectly fine without us, and it will continue to be perfectly fine. So this means that our value, our humanity, comes from the only world in which we can live, which is a human world. And we need to start thinking about that world in terms of the relationship it has and its fragility. We, this is one of the reasons why some of the things sometimes we deprecate, we do so at our peril. Most people think about morality and politics, and then they think, and you can have some art. But really think about it. If you took the aesthetic dimensions of life out, what would life be? Every one of you, the first thing you did when you move into a place is decorate. We don't just pick up grains and throw them in our mouth. We cook them, we season them. All of those things are the production of a human reality that makes life livable. If we took away those dimensions, that human beings would walk off of a cliff. 
So once we realize the world we, we're to live in, there's a danger when we begin to develop the misanthropic spirit, human hating. We're in a period right now, profound human hating. And when I say human hating, I mean, for instance, even the way we think of ourselves, as, there's a distinction between being an individual and being human. Because an individual is a fantasy of being able to be by yourself. But last I heard, no human being is born and able to grow by ourselves. We're fragile creatures of community. So I'm going to, since it's Black History Month, I'm going to close with a story that is of philosophical importance. The story is connected to something that we must take very seriously. So first a concept, then the story. The concept is the concept of power. We live in an age where people speak disparagingly about power. The people's like, I don't like your power. Power corrupts. But that is because people think of power as coercive. You notice when a lot of people talk about power, they don't define it. So let me offer a definition. Power is the ability to make things happen with access to the conditions of doing so. Every one of you have abilities, but if there were no conditions, you can't act. If you had no power, you couldn't have gotten up this morning. You couldn't get here. But no matter how, no matter how many abilities you have, if there's no floor, you can't stand. If there's no food, you have no energy. If there's no, there's a long list of conditions that enable us to have power, to have, to, to act on our abilities. And as you know, there are some people who try to hoard those conditions. They try to block access to them from other people. That disempowers people. That's the privatization of power. So, if you're going to deal with dehumanization, dehumanization is the disempowering of people from access to the conditions by which they could live their humanity. This means then that if we're going to fight against degradation, oppression, and a lot of those things, we must deal with power and the access to it. This is one of the reasons why, for instance, I'm committed to public institutions. I used to teach in the Ivy League and all my books, I argue that you must build a public institution. So I said, I better go teach in public institutions. This is why this institution is important and many like it, not only in this country, but across the world. Because you see, if you privatize power globally, most of humankind will be in bondage. But if you unleash, if you can unleash access to power. And now I don't wanna make things a zero sum game. That's not the point. It's just that we need to understand what it is if we're gonna believe in concepts like democracy, that it's not simply about saying people can vote or people can speak. We need to create the conditions for people to do so. So the story, and then I'm done. This story, when, you, when I say things like this, people always say, but what can I do, right? You're talking about changing the world. What can I do? And this is a very narcissistic question because I'm not saying people are gods, okay? It, the real question is what can we do? But nevertheless, people say, what can I do? So I'm gonna tell the story. The story begins as follows. There was a woman from the late 18th century, a black woman. She was enslaved. Because she was enslaved, she was called property. Because she was called property, it meant the decisions over her, her life were in the hands of those who owned her. The enslaver would impregnate her and the laws were that the mother 
if she's enslaved, her children are enslaved. So all of her children were enslaved. Back then, the mother, the child will be taken to be raised by an elder slave, enslaved person until the child was about six or seven where they could labor. Now, enslaved people are not like many of us stereotype them to be today. Uh, and to cut to the chase, this country wouldn't have prospered if enslaved people were like the lies people tell you of brutish people walking in jungles. A lot of the people who are enslaved are educated people with skill sets that they brought to this country from irrigation to understandings of inoculation to architectural styles. And not, it is not true that they were illiterate. Illiteracy was forced upon them many of the subsequently born people, but many were literate. This woman was literate. And among the grave, the, 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 the grapevine, the other enslaved people, they had developed complex system of news. She was, in, she was in the fields working from sunrise till sunset. And her name was Harriet Bailey. Now Harriet Bailey learned that her last child was on a plantation 12 miles away. He was about six and a half years old. Learning this, at sunset, she went off her plantation, took whatever scraps of food she had, and traveled to see that boy. She faced perils, not only wild animals, but people who could have accused her of being an escaped slave. When she would reach the child, she would share the little food she had because the child was reduced to fighting for scraps with the dog. There was one time she defended the child against a belligerent cook. She did this for six months and then she died. Now, when I teach this story of Harriet Bailey, I have to remind my students, because I also teach on psychoanalysis, philosophy, medicine, and psychiatry. One of the things we know about children is it doesn't matter for a child why your parent is absent. Anybody who has children know this. If you say we're poor, I had to work. If you say I was a slave, all a child knows is that the child was abandoned. So I would ask my students, what would go through the mind of that child when that woman did what she did? And my students immediately understood that the child was in a world that said the child only had one kind of value. The value of being property to the owner. However, that act by Harriet Bailey made this little boy learn about another value. And the value is called love. Because you see, if you're loved, how do you explain this, right? You know that you're called a thing, but why does this person love you? Now, at this point in the story, it's rather interesting because you see this boy could have got full of himself. He could have said, unlike you all other slaves, I'm loved. But that's not what happened. This boy at 16 ended up fighting a slave breaker. He defended himself against being whipped. And what's striking is because he learned the value of love, he didn't kill the man, but he was in a context where he could have been killed. But the value of love made him think about the value of human beings. He eventually escaped from enslavement, got to New York and changed his name. And he became an abolitionist. He changed his name from Frederick Bailey to Frederick Douglass. So now you all know who that is. But as I said, the story is not about Frederick Douglass. 
the stories about Harriet Bailey. Because you see, if you read his narratives, you read his My Bondage, My Freedom, and then you read The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, in each one he brings the story up of Harriet Bailey closer and closer to finally the beginning. Because you see, what Frederick Bailey was being taught was that to be loved by an enslaved woman was not a valuable kind of love. If he valued being loved by somebody the society said was not valuable, that linked him into dealing with a more global sense of humanity. That is why when he became an abolitionist, he not only fought against slavery, but he also fought for suffrage, for women's rights. It's because he was able to, he also got involved in thinking about the situation of Haiti. It's because of those connections, that common humanity, he was able to act. But here's the crucial point. From an individualistic, self-centered model of action, Harriet Bailey died a failure. But if we can understand our actions are not about ourselves, but part of something greater than ourselves, then her act of love transcended her life. She died not knowing if that child loved her. She died not knowing the role she played in abolition and the transformation of this country. And this is where the crucial issue comes in. Because this room today looks the way it does in Kansas because of a whole bunch of people none of you know. But we all are able to meet here. Look at even me speaking in front of you because those people acted. The thing about those anonymous people is that when action really matters, it's not about you, but it's an expression of a radical form of love that transcends you. I see this radical form of love as really crucial because you see the problematic colonial narcissistic model of love, the lie is that you could only love the reproduction of yourself. But imagine someone walks up and says, I love you. And you get philosophical and say, why? And the person says, because you're like me and I love me. And a lot of the history of colonialism and racism and a lot of the isms is an effort to try to force people to be the reproduction of the dominator. But you know, there's another kind of love. There's the kind of love in which you say, I love you. And it doesn't have to be that you're like me, but you love the celebration of the existence and the freedom of others. When we act to build a better society, it's ultimately for people we will never know. But we don't have to know them because if we act in ways that really matter, if we act from the existential commitment for them to be empowered with a life worth living, a life livable for their time. What else are we gonna have, although we will not hear it, but them looking back and say those very important, beautiful words. Thank you. Have a microphone so that you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand uh, so that everyone in the room can hear you, but also the people who are joining us um, uh, during the program. So, uh, Elliot will bring the mic for the program. Is that your hand in the Oh, we're being streamed. I, well, hi, those who are streaming in.
Thank you so much for that um, really provocative talk. Um, I'm curious about, you talked a little bit about the ways that we have come to this moment where people are thinking about conflict um, in terms of war, right? And kind of eliminating the other. Um, do you have any ideas about what brought us to this point? Um, like, where do you see that sh more of that shift happening? Um, and then, how do we get how do we get out of it? Um, because I do think it, it's very true that people are less interested in in listening. You talked about like to see the other and hear the other, and um, that there seem there seem to be fewer opportunities for that, or people less willing to do that. So, just any thoughts you have on that subject? Lots of thoughts. In fact, I'm writing a book called Decol Decolonizing Psychoanalysis. And part of that is we tend to look at people so structurally that we forget about people in terms of what's going on with them. The short answer, there, there are several things. The short answer is people are afraid. That's a short answer. I've written a lot on why people would lie to themselves and lots of other things like those, but there are several things at work. The, uh, there, it's not that there are one, one of the things we have to get rid of when we talk about people is we're often are trying to look for the one thing, but actually we're always multiple things meet, meeting. So we need to be able to look at how a variety of forces converge, okay? A good example is when we talk about, for instance, when we talk about in the past issues, say, of violence, we often say it's violence or nonviolence. That's a binary. The problem with that is that would, that would leave a whole lot of people to just be bystanders to violence. If you intervene in violence, you're entangled in it. And you could be called violence, violent if you're involved in stomping violence. Some people, unfortunately, get into counter-violence where their goal is not actually stop violence. They just want to change who the violator is. They want to change the players, not the game. But anti-violence, and this is something Drusilla Cornell, Franz Fanon, I and others have written on, Anti-violence means you have to set that point I said about conditions, okay? Now, when I told that story about conditions, I said there are people trying to set conditions to privatize power, to block things. A lot of the people who do that know very well that humanity depends on uh, deprivatizing power. But the thing about it is that a lot of those people don't live under the ethos of cross-generational accountability. And what I mean by that is if you see yourself as not accountable to ancestors or to descendants, then you treat your own death as the end of the world. So if your death is the end of the world, then you might as well get all yours now at the expense of others. So already we need to begin to break those of us who are committed to that anonymous possibility have to do a different kind of work. The mistake sometimes made is that people say, we ought to do something, and then they do this. But when we see something that needs to be done, that's our generation being called to do something. The things we can do, the reason I told the Harriet Bailey story is because everything would say that her actions were, the idea that her actions mattered would be false. But the reality is the commitments, that's the crucial issue. And as we're dealing with the world as it is right now, the thing about it is 
we cannot predict the future. The only thing we know about the future is it can't happen without our actions. So we need to think about the actions we have that where we may not see the outcome, but how those actions are definitely connected in the investment in global humanity acting. And global humanity is on such a smaller planet right now. One of the things that we're not taking very seriously is we're imposing upon the 21st century values that were developed for a time when our planet was very big. You know, there was a time on our planet when if you could get from this part of the planet to the next part of the planet in 10,000 years, that's a short time. Then it became a few hundred years. Then it became three years. Then it became six weeks. Now, if you go to the airport and you can't get to the other side of the planet in 24 hours, you're pissed off. But similarly, we can communicate with people on the other side of the planet, even people who may be viewing this in a nanosecond. Well, when the time it takes to cross space becomes shorter, space shrinks. So we need a value system for a tiny blue dot in that actually is smaller. We live in a smaller world. We need to start thinking politically and ethically about what it is to live in that kind of world. And some of the ideas I have are some, what people may consider radical. One of them is, I think we need to get rid of nation states. Because as long as you have nation states, you create illegal people. You create people who, and, and nowhere on our planet should anybody be illegal. If people are not illegal, then if they're not treated right somewhere, they just go somewhere else. Which means if you want to retain people, you got to give them better living conditions. There are lots of other things. If we have a global understanding of non I'm not against nations. We can have nations, just not nation states. Then what we can do is begin to address our environmental problems. Because all we need, all that needs to happen right now is no matter how many good ideas we have, somebody just say, yo, my nation state doesn't want to do it. Even though we all have to breathe the same pollution, we have to deal with the same fisheries, we have to deal with the same meteorological conditions. So I do think that it's not one shoe size fits all, but each of us has to do our part. Those of us who are intellectuals have to use our imagination, our ideas, our scientific knowledge. You know the way I talked about, for instance, that the entire university is actually the humanities? Right? If we can bring our, the humanistic responsibility into our technologies and our science, right? Technology and science are not the same thing, right? Short version, we are actually technology. We don't realize it. It's not that we use technology. We are actually technology. But that complicated relationship, if we can bring a lot of that, we just start doing it, then we are setting the foundations for what is to come. There will always be somebody, you know, you know, as Stephen Colbert said, you know, uh, he was talking about uh, uh, one of the uh, Republican candidates where she was saying, you know, this is not a racist country. And Stephen Colbert said, you know, if you have a nice cake, but you put a little poop in it, you have poop cake, <laughs> right? So I, I'm aware there's always somebody who's trying to put poop in our cake. But sometimes it's not in a cake. Sometimes you're making a good cake, but the poop is in the icing. And that sometimes you got to say, I'll pass on icing. So what I'm saying is we need to figure out wherever we are, we need to understand our actions really matter. And it's not that we're gods, but that human world I'm talking about of the interconnectedness of power, that is what's going to affect these issues. And people would say, 
But, but that's very optimistic. And the answer is no. I don't believe in optimism or pessimism. Nancy could tell you about that. We've, I've written on this. I believe in existential commitment. I think the real question with these issues is not about whether we know what will work, is whether we're committed to making things work. And that's why I like the analogy that I use with conflict. You know, when you marry someone, right? If your partner, he, she, or they, when you marry someone, you don't know what's gonna happen. But at that moment, if you're committed to the relationship, then even in its difficult times, you're gonna work at making it work. Well, similarly, just like when I'm playing out of tune instruments, or if I have an opportunity to go to the Arctic, right, to meet people, or in some cases, there are these moments where there are interactions where just for that moment, we could have destroyed another, but we actually contributed to the well-being of another. That is ultimately what humanity is about. So the, there are people who would like to lie to us that it is so-called human nature for us to be in this warlike way. I was on a podcast this morning where we talked about this issue and I said, no, that's one of the big lies. If that were human nature, our species would have died out a long time ago. It is, it is just, what it is is we just need a sufficient number of us committed to the positive. And I could give a short allegory from Audre Lorde. Everybody knows the Audre Lorde saying, I mean, those of you who know, who know poetry and literature, the master's tool doesn't tear down the master's house, right? Everybody heard that. But one thing Audre Lorde did not say, she forgot to mention masters don't build houses. It's the workers, the everyday people, the women, the men, the non-binary, the everybody who build houses. And those tools are our tools. It's not white people's tools, black people's tools, Native American. No, it's humanity's tools. And if we use those tools and build other houses, then so-called master's house becomes irrelevant. You know, the greatest fear of bigotry is irrelevance. If somebody's hatred of you ceases to have power, they're irrelevant. So so-called master, notice nobody's knocking on the door anymore because there are all these nice houses where people are dancing, having good conversation, eating good food, treating each other better. And after a while, you know what will happen. Old Mr. Master would either try and come and torch it, <laughs> but people could say, no, 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 not happening. Or old so-called master would show up and say, you know, I want to be part of the party. And then you say, well, you're going to give up that master's nonsense? Yeah. <laughs> Come on in. Because ultimately, even the people we call masters are human beings. Um, something I highly recommend to all of you, if you get the chance, I highly recommend you read Christopher Columbus's Four Voyages. Any of y'all ever read that? You gotta read it. It's amazing. The reason I is because you will see in the first voyage, there was no ill intent whatsoever. There were all kinds of things that by an unusual series of circumstances, that led to five years later, suddenly Columbus and a lot of others, there were some schmucks in there, but I'm talking about the Admiral Columbus, suddenly waking up and saying, when did I become the bad guy? And this is the point, we become very arrogant when we walk into every situation presuming we're the good person. Give you another shout out, Nancy. The, the good person in all of us is something we got to work at. And that's what the message is. Hi, what's your name? Hi, Betsy. Thank Hi, you Betsy. so much. It was wonderful, wonderful on so many levels to hear this tonight. Um, 
So thank you. And thanks to Giselle and the Hall Center, as always. Um, I, I want to ask about the scalar level because I think about power a lot um, with the work I do as a scholar, the work I do as a human, and I am riveted by all of your both defining and and pondering those definitions and 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 how they fit in with other definitions, even if they're not those definitions aren't spoken. Um, and I, the we of humanity has a very big problem in the middle of it called the United States of America, and. I genuinely um, just think that all those people who are thinking about fishable water and water that exists so that there is our fish, many, 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 many of them are doing exactly what you said. And it doesn't matter because of the United States and the World Trade Organization, for example. And I'm not trying to be only reductionist, but that's more or less true. I mean, or it's it's true enough for the sake of my question, let's say. And, you know, or South Africa, where you've spent time, is a very important example of this in terms of the laws regulating fishing in those waters. So I'm wondering, okay, so how how then do we apply this idea of thinking about access to power and access to resources and access to the conditions of when um you know, who is the subject of struggle? Who is the object? What's, how's the goal set? Who gets to set it? Where is it located? It's so many millions of miles away from, you know, the Eastern Cape for those fisher people. And so I, I just am wondering how, you know, because I know you think very completely daily, practically about how your students can go out into the world and do exactly this. And, you know, it can be a version of Harriet Bailey where you may never know the impact you've had. And it could be a version of, you have a student who sends you a letter and tells you exactly the day they learned something that changed their life. And, you know, all of that we have to believe exists because if I don't, it's hard to sometimes know what we're doing at university for, for me if we don't. Um, but I, you know, and then to take that scalar level to the household, you know, there is a truth to be found among men who believe they are so disempowered by the world they live in as workers that it's legitimate to physically abuse and emotionally abuse the women and children in their lives. And so conflict and power are in a, a relationship there. And I know I'm not saying things you don't think about, just wondering if you'd speak about them. Well, there are a lot of things and I know we're here a long time. So the short answer, <laughs> the short answer is one big problem we've inherited is a fear of addressing political problems with political solutions. We are often moralizing the situation, but when we moralize them, we put too much of the weight on, individ on individuals instead of understanding how institutions work. Iris Marion Young is very good at this in her writings, and there are many others. So the short version, because again, we have limited time, we should write one another for one thing so we should be keep in touch about this, is that uh, action has to begin somewhere. And the thing is to start. There's, there, there, people say it allegorically, you know, thousand mile journeys begin with first steps, those kind of things. You don't climb a mountain by looking at the top, you look at the steps along the way. Uh, there are very practical things when I give talks on leadership and building institutions that would go way beyond the scope of here. So in the future, if we keep in touch, we can talk about them. But realistically, we have to have a coherent sense of time. We have to there, there, we, we have to rethink what politics is. Too many of us think it's about elections and governments and so forth. No. Governing and politics are different. The kind of institutions that deal with the negotiating and building of power at the level of a society, that's what politics is about. And that's what we have to cultivate and do. The other thing is we also have to get rid of some of our idols. Among the idols is if you pick a country like the United States, the United States has, in psychoanalytical terms, a daddy problem. Have you noticed that? Everything's about founding fathers, fathers, fathers. Even when I looked at the 2016 election, I looked and I looked and I said, oh my God, I don't realize. It's an obsession. In the United States, we're so obsessed with fathers in this country that as long as you got a father, you think you're safe. This is what happens when people are obsessed with security. So whether it's an abusive father or a loving father, 
as long as the father you think you're fine that's why i was like oh my god bernie's the loving father trump is the abusive father but both are fathers hillary just stood no chance right so we're going to have to break out of this father obsession the psychoanalytical problem of erasing the complexity and the true way in which power functions in our society there's so many times we look at male images without and, and invisible eyes the production, the labor, the power that women and many other groups who may not identify as women or men put into making things function. So there's a lot, I mean, there's a long thing on that, uh, but that would be different. There's an entire lecture I give where I, I talk about just those issues, okay? But the short answer in the end is that we need to understand that our political actions matter. That's the, that's the shorter version. And the political actions are about building institutions that work. They're, they're, and that, those include even institutions students are building on this campus. They're institutions about faculty with one another. They're community institutions. But ultimately, this, this sociality of power is what we'll have to do. And the sociality of power also could deal with the person who is coercive. Because, that mean, because a community can m m march in and say, don't do that. You're accountable to the community. But anyway, I, I know people have been here a long time. That's why I want to make it short, that answer. Thank you so much. I, um, you've taken us through, um, like, all around the world and through hundreds of thousands of years of, <laughs> of history and thought. But um, I, I didn't actually realize what time it was. And so um, we do have some books for sale in the back. So if you'd like to purchase a book um, from, uh, thank you to the Raven for um, coming out and having some books for sale. And then if you would be willing to sign some books for I'd a few delighted. minutes, and then you can chat a little bit more um, with Professor Gordon um, in the last few minutes that we have. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.